Everyone's cancer journey is different. Facing a diagnosis is often one of the scariest experiences someone can face. Daily routines are upended as a whirl of information, doctor visits, and treatment side effects upend lives, not only for patients, but also for their loved ones as well. Listening to how other patients have made their way through their cancer journeys can be helpful and inspiring. Joining us now are three amazing people who are here to share with you their stories about cancer, immunotherapy, clinical trials, and living beyond a prognosis. Moderating the panel is Brian Brewer, Chief Communications Officer at the Cancer Research Institute. Don't forget to put your questions and comments for the panel in the Q&A box. All right then, let's listen to what these experienced cancer veterans have to say. Hello, everyone, and welcome to this segment of the CRI Virtual Immunotherapy Patient Summit. I'm Brian Brewer from the Cancer Research Institute, and I'm very much looking forward to hearing from our next group of speakers. We just heard a great presentation from Dr. Fetchy about clinical trials and how they can offer patients access to cutting-edge immunotherapies and the highest quality cancer care. If you're tuning in just now and missed our earlier sessions on immunotherapy basics and clinical trials, don't worry. All our sessions from our two-day summit will be made available on demand in the weeks ahead. Now, we'll hear from three remarkable people who will share their experiences with cancer and how immunotherapy and clinical trials save their lives. Stephanie Ganji is a writer who lives in New York City. Her latest book, Carry the Dog, has just come out on paperback this month. In addition to writing, she's also been navigating breast cancer since 1999. Sunshine Peguiz is now retired and living in Arizona. I'm a little jealous, Sunshine. Enjoying every day to its fullest. She's also a survivor of stage four lung cancer and today is the very definition of thriver. John White is a 67 year old retiree from the biotechnology and medical device research industry and is now living in the suburbs of Boston where he enjoys gardening, classic cars, golfing and advocating for cancer patients. He's also a long-term survivor of stage four metastatic prostate cancer. Welcome, Stephanie, Sunshine, and John. Thank you for joining us and sharing your perspectives on your cancer immunotherapy experiences. So let's get to it. When We'll start with Stephanie. Stephanie, when were you first diagnosed with cancer, and what type and stage was it at diagnosis, and how did the diagnosis impact you, your loved ones, or your community? So I was first diagnosed with breast cancer in uh, 1999. I was in my mid-40s at the time, and I had no history of breast cancer in my family, so it was kind of a stunning diagnosis. And I was diagnosed with ductal carcinoma in situ and um, actually fared pretty well for a year. I had some... uh, you know, basic treatments and nothing too radical. And then uh, just about a year later, Mm -hmm. I was diagnosed again with occult tumors that had not been seen the first time around. And I guess I I and all of my um, oncology team went into high alert and I had all the treatments that one gets thrown, what, what gets thrown at one. Uh, in a very short period of time, radiation, chemotherapy, surgeries, um, all kinds of things happened in a very compressed time frame. And then I recurred within a year and was diagnosed with stage three breast cancer um, to the chest wall, which was terrifying. And at the time, again, this by this time, it was the early 2000s, there were not any good news stories, certainly not on the internet. Everything that was posted by navigators like myself was all bad news, bad news. And so, you know, I was pretty terrified. The impact was massive. I had young children and um, a busy life that I really loved. And then uh, I was treated again with chemotherapy. So I had had it twice and I was cancer free for 10 years. And then I recurred in 2011. And then I had uh, went metastatic in 2014. 
And since 2000, I'm the very poster child of chronic disease. And I saw that change over the course of my life, my, from 40 to my 60s, I saw how breast cancer changed. And I was luckily the recipient of every new thing that came along until about a year and a half ago and we sort of ran out of options or a year ago, ran out of options and uh, I had progressed again and it was not looking great. And I entered a clinical trial for immunotherapy in January of this year and I completed it in July of this year. And my results are astonishing. My I just this week had my third set of scans since beginning and um, I get emotional, but my scans have actually improved. Uh, that's a fresh result. I just saw it yesterday. It was uh, at Mount Sinai, which is my hospital and saw that my scans are even better than they were in July. So that's, that's the journey I'm on. <laughs> it's kind of crazy. Wonderful. Uh, John, how about you? Uh, how 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 were you diagnosed with cancer, and, and what happened? Yeah, I was uh, I was diagnosed in the fall of 2014. Had a uh, perfectly fine physical in January of the same year. Never had a symptom until uh, late that fall when I got diagnosed, uh, and it was uh, the worst possible news that I was stage four metastatic prostate cancer. Um, I went into conventional therapies right away to include a year and a half of chemotherapy, uh, multiple um, deprivation type drugs that, that anybody that's familiar with prostate cancer, it's being more of a hormonal cancer. So they shut off your testosterone, either uh, chemically or, or physically. Um, and Nothing seemed to be working for me. Uh, they it couldn't drop my PSA, but the thing from the beginning was I had a very low PSA, which indicated that for the amount of disease I had, that I was dealing with something uh, extremely uh, different than the, the normal form of it. And that kind of began my journey into immunotherapy at that point. Uh, I had genetic and genomic sequencing done on the tumor and indicated I was a, a high burden mutation that might respond to uh, several PD-1 immunotherapy drugs. Uh, we decided on one and I started that. I've had 55 infusions over six years and I'm currently uh, in long-term durable clinical remission, uh, no evidence of disease. I am now on a uh, a biannual schedule that I get uh, treatment, two maintenance doses uh, twice a year and annual scans. So I've come a, a long way um, and I advocate heavily for, for prostate cancer in, in all forms. And Sunshine, how about you? Mine is um, a little interesting for about a year and 2010 time frame, I was having pains in my elbow. And I was going to the doctor every two or three weeks complaining about the pain. And at that time, it was just chalked up to you're getting old, it's, you know, tennis elbow, it's this, you're golfing, etc. I continued to go to the doctor at, at a minimum monthly to say, okay, something's going on. The doctor took x-rays, et cetera, and nothing was shown. You know, I was told, don't have cancer, blah, blah, blah. This went on for a year. Finally, and I say very luckily, my insurance required the doctor to do a CT scan because they were seeing all these repeat appointments and repeat x-rays, et cetera. And when they did the CT scan, I was told that I had stage four lung cancer. Uh, needless to say, I was very furious and very angry uh, because I was like, I've been coming to you, you know, for a year. So I rushed off and 
got sent to an oncologist who immediately put me into traditional treatment at that time. So the official diagnosis was March of 2011. I did traditional treatment from probably the May time frame because you know it takes a while for them to get you all set up and ready. I, by traditional treatment, I mean chemotherapy. I did three rounds of chemo, and then I was scheduled for 36 rounds of radiation. My radiation was cut short at uh, the 30 round because they inadvertently had burned the skin off my neck with the radiation, and so I could not continue. At that point, I was in Florida, and they were pretty much preparing me to die. I had requested to move back to Seattle with my work because I was very familiar with a Fred Hutchinson Cancer Research and Seattle Cancer Care, and I wanted to go up there to get their opinion of my condition. I made it there in July of 2011, and they immediately, which was very devastating, were preparing me for death. They were telling me what to do because based on what they saw in my records, that's where I was at. I was, you know, shortly going to die. Um, but luckily, one of my oncologists was starting a drug trial for chemotherapy. And at this point, it was the first time this trial or the drug was being used for lung cancer. It was not meant for lung cancer. So it was something that they were going to try. And they asked me, you know, with all the disclaimers, if I would participate. So I did um, immunotherapy for over two years, every two weeks. And I ended that in March of 2014. And I have not had a treatment since March of 2014. The doctors were very cautious because I was one of 50 people. And it was very early stage as far as the drug trial to declare me NED. So it took them until 2020 to declare me NED. And that was the best news I ever had because as they said, you didn't have any evidence, but we didn't know because you're the only one from that trial that was still around. So they didn't want to declare me early. Uh, and I just had my recent scan in September and I'm still NED. So, uh, but they're more amazed that I haven't had a treatment since March of 2014. It's so good to hear that each of you uh, was lucky enough to find the, the, the right trial or have the right test done uh, to, to get you eligible to receive immunotherapy. And, uh, you know, e each of you is exactly what we at the Cancer Research Institute want to see for every cancer patient, but of course, unfortunately, we're not there yet. Um, you are still the exception to the rule. Um, and, uh, but what's wonderful about the fact that you, all of you are here, you're living proof that immunotherapy can bring people back from the brink of death, as in Sunshine's case, um, mm -hmm. and, or, and, and all of you. Uh, I, I know cancer is an extremely scary thing, and, and we heard from Stephanie about how it just completely rattled her, her very full life. And I imagine that's the case for almost everyone. Um, John, John, you mentioned uh, that your doctor had done a screen. I'm curious about, uh, for Stephanie and Sunshine, had you also had your tumors tested? Was there any, any work there done to identify whether or not you would be eligible for an immunotherapy? Let's start with Stephanie. Yeah, I had uh, had tumors tested all along. And it, my doctor uh, is uh, also a researcher, so she was very keen to make sure she had all the information and data available. So I had had my tumors tested, but uh, I was not, it, it, I wasn't clear to me at the time that I was a candidate for immunotherapy. And the reason that I was entered into the trial is because I was being faced with chemo again. So that would have been the third time uh, since I was first diagnosed with cancer that I would be having the bad chemo, you know, the full on treatment. And I'd been through every oral chemotherapy, every radiation, every surgery, I, I, everything possible had happened. 
And I said to my doctor, you know, you've got all the results of the tumor testing. Am I a candidate? And she said, let me go look. And she found an immunotherapy trial that was right for me that was starting soon. And um, I just am so grateful and kind of still astonished that I'm sitting here today having this conversation uh, with hair and not sick and not in chemo again, um, because I was actually starting to wonder, I'm 66 years old, am I going to put myself through that again? So the fact that this alternative was presented to me was just kind of a little miracle, frankly. Uh, did you feel like you were rolling the dice or yes. how did you make that decision? I had always been a really good patient and a good soldier and done everything that the conventional wisdom told me. And, you know, the usual um, slash and burn and poison regimen. And by the way, it had worked and kept me going for 20 years. Uh, so every time I moved, I progressed. But this time I was a little bit older and I knew that I had what was called indolent cancer, even though it was stage four, it was moving slowly. So I thought, am I going to experience chemo again and lose another year of my life of, you know, my normal life, let's say, or shall I wait and see? And of course, my doctor hated that answer <laughs> and uh, found this immunotherapy trial that she thought I was a good candidate for. And boy, am I glad she did. Again, so grateful. And, um, you know, I just hope that it's something that will become available more widely uh, and that women and men who have cancer get access, the access they need to find out about the trials. And you guys are doing such great work around that. Thanks. You know, prostate, lung, and breast cancer are the big three, right? So yeah. uh, it's I, I think it's wonderful that, you know, each of you is here and can demonstrate and prove that, that this works. Sunshine, uh, were any tests done on, on your tumors? Did you have to ask for them? Or was that part of your care once you got to Seattle? Keeping in mind, this was 2011. Um, there was no test done on my tumors prior to me entering the trial, but during the trial, there were continuous monitoring. Uh, I, used, I joked with my oncologist because um, when the trial was over and we looked at you know, the success, uh, I said, well, <laughs> this trial wasn't very successful because you know, at that time, I was like the only one still in the trial when I ended it. And he, he assured me one thing, he goes, it was very successful because we weren't supposed to use this drug on lung cancer. We used it on you and 50 other, 49 other people. And during this time, our research arm was evaluating every, all of your results so that two years into this, we now know who can use this drug. So I, I feel like my role in this was really giving them data so that they could effectively use the drug for others and know how instead of it being a, you know, I don't want to say crapshoot, but pretty much with me it was, but they, two years into this, they had enough information. And that's something I had to do when I went into this trial was give them permission to use my information the research arm, which wasn't really associated with the trial, but it was associated with their cancer research to be able to look at how was this and how it could be targeted. And so once he told me that, I really felt blessed in a lot of ways because I was like, I was able to help advance this where, you know, they didn't know with me, it was just like, hey, you're, you're, you're going into this and we hope it works type thing. But there was no guarantees. There was no forecast. All it was um, was we're extending your your life through this. And one of the biggest, I think, blessings for me was when my oncologist said, 
You've been preparing to die. Now you need to learn to live again. Mm-hmm. And that was that, that a, was an eye opener. Yeah, that with more and more people surviving mm-hmm. cancer, there's a, a lot of activity around how do you live beyond you know the the prognosis. Uh, and uh, there's support services and groups and programs all about survivorship and. Uh, we know that those programs are going to continue to grow because more and more people are benefiting. Uh, did they happen to say, Sunshine, why you responded to therapy? Did they say, what was unique about you that, that made you respond? They never shared that with me, but what they did share with me, which was great, was during the you know 2015 to like 2019 time frame when I was getting scans every six months, there, they said, we know how your system responds to stuff. So if there's any reoccurrence, we know what to give you. So they never shared what it was, but they did definitely have enough information. And that was very, for me, it was very comforting. Because I went into every scan going, well, if something's there, they know what to do, or they say they do, so I, I, I'm I'm good. So I, I've never like uh, been afraid. I mean, that was so devastating. I mean, to just be told you've got stage four and now start preparing yourself to die. Um, I mean, I had very young, well, they you know teenagers, and I just totally threw my world in a uproar. And I, but I was lucky because my company allowed me to move back to Seattle because none of this would have been possible if I wouldn't have gotten into that drug. You were very fortunate, I think, to, to choose a treatment center that is connected to a research uh, institution. Um, one thing that CRI does with its clinical trials is ensure that we learn as much as possible from every patient about their immune response, what's happening uh, at the tumor site, what's happening in the blood, and what can we learn? And even uh, those patients, unfortunately, who don't uh, benefit from immunotherapy, we, they still contribute helpful information, useful information, just, just as you said. And, and some patients uh, who go into clinical trials, that's a motivator uh, for them, not just to survive and, and, and go beyond cancer, but also to help other people. Um, so thanks for sharing that. John, uh, you mentioned that uh, your doctor tested your tumor and you, he, found, he or she found that you had a high tumor mutational burden or TMB. Did he, or how, did, how did your doctor explain uh, TMB to you and how would you explain that to other people? Uh, yeah, I'm, I at first might add, Brian, that immunotherapy is, is not, a, not a treatment that's new. When I started out in biotech almost 30 years ago, it was being researched then as to uh, using our own immune systems to, to fight disease. So it's nothing new. Yes, it, you know, within the last 10 years, it's become more prominent um, for many types of cancer. And my own situation, um, when I failed to uh, respond to uh, conventional treatments, for my disease, um, it was decided uh, by my treatment center, my my genitourinary oncologist, who was also the director of the molecular oncology research labs, decided in my case to take it a little bit further and find out why I had such uh, a high burden disease with such a low PSA. And it was determined through further testing in his pathology lab that I have what's called small cell neuroendocrine differentiation. Um, so not only was it the adenocarcinoma, but it had a, a mix. And my prognosis was extremely poor, uh, you know, six months to a year, perhaps. Um, and it was decided then that I had nothing to lose. You know, let's go, let's uh, get the tumor removed. I had a prostatectomy. It was sent to Foundation uh, Medicine, as many of you know, is, is into the genetic and genomic sequencing. And as you said, my testing showed that I carried a very rare, what they call a pole mutation, that expressed a high burden mutation, which means uh, many different uh, mutations in the tumor. And I was uh, 
absolutely a candidate for targeted treatments, which led us to uh, uh, immunotherapy. Uh, the thing with foundation medicine is that they have such a huge database that um, once they know what's driving your cancer, they can match you to uh, possible treatment options. And like I said, my, mm -hmm. in my case, it was uh, Keytruda or Pembrolizumab. Um, I started out on that and within three months, I started showing disease regression. Uh, like I said, I've been on uh, over 55 infusions over six years. I'm done with treatment, uh, albeit uh, annual maintenance doses and annual scans. And I'm currently in uh, long-term clinical durable remission, no evidence of disease. That, that's amazing. And, and it's actually, uh, that, that's a pattern we see with a lot of patients who do benefit from immunotherapy because it's mobilizing your immune system, which is living in you. Uh, the protection that it affords you is durable, lasts beyond, long beyond the treatment uh, because your immune system has <clears throat> learned and remembers uh, to go right. after that. So that's, that's great. And, and Stephanie, uh, you know, your journey, uh, you mentioned chemotherapy gave you 20 years. And I think it's important to mention that, you know, chemotherapy and radiation and surgery aren't going away. Uh, immunotherapy is not completely replacing those other modalities. Um, in fact, immunotherapy is great in combination with a lot of those modalities. Um, chemo and, and immunotherapy have been proven effective in a number of cancers, radiation, immunotherapy, even surgery, uh, giving immunotherapy before surgery or after surgery. So there's a lot of looking at when is the right time to, to give a patient uh, immunotherapy. But um, uh, Stephanie, you know, you went from thing to thing to thing, right? Uh, just enough. And, and, and this is also another uh, thing that patients um, who do manage to survive, who do live beyond, who have that desire to find, you know, to stay alive, um, just get to the next thing, get what's available. With all that ongoing research, something else may come along as it did in all of your cases. And that's fascinating. You know, just, just keep holding on. Well, wait for the miracle, I guess, is, is something that I've heard. Don't give up. Stephanie, t tell us about your particular treatment. What was it? How was it administered? And how was it different from your prior experiences with treatment? So I entered into, I learned about the clinical trial at the end of December and entered into it at the beginning of January. So I didn't do a lot of research. I just, I've had a longstanding, wonderful relationship with my oncologist. So I kind of just let her steer. And uh, the first thing that happened was I had have, I've had radiation many times, um, maybe four or five already. And the first part of this um, immunotherapy trial was, I think it was 17 days or 14 days of radiation consecutively. And then I began uh, receiving shots in... Um, I think for the first week it was every day, which was horrible, and then and then it tapered off to weekly, and then there was a second drug. It was a three drug protocol, and then the last drug was Keytruda, and uh, it was all literally injections into a tumor site, and I had um, I actually went in maybe at the end of April, no, I'm sorry, end of March to say, you know, this is really rough. I'd lost a lot of weight. I, I was being so heavily monitored with uh, labs and scans and doctors and different doctors. I mean, I was just bouncing around uh, the cancer center and well known to everyone there. And, you know, I, I thought, as I think Sunshine mentioned, there were no guarantees. I didn't really have a line of sight into what might happen. I was just in this other world, this vortex of more medical stuff than I had previously. And, you know, I decided with the help and insistence of my team that I would stick it out. And the three drug protocol was not easy, but it paid off. And 
by the way, here I am, you know, three or four months later with a fantastic scan and an improved scan. So it's even better than it was when I first stopped the trial. So, I mean, I, I can't remember. I have an excellent capacity to compartmentalize and, and, you know, all the names of all the drugs because there have been so many. Um, so that, that's, that's it. I went through every, I'm on, I'm actually, as I sit here today, completely drug free. Uh, it's the first time in decades that I'm not on some kind of cancer treatment. And um, it's hard to say more than that. <laughs> it's a pretty good news story. Absolutely. Absolutely. And Sunshine, uh, do you, what, what drug or treatment did you receive and, and how was it administered? Well, first I would like to say I'm, I'm so excited that Stephanie was on Petruda because actually the drug trial that I participated in led to Petruda. So I'm always ecstatic when I, I, I hear someone's using that. Yeah, um, yeah, sure. I, my treatment um, was pretty much... Uh, intravenous. I had it every two weeks. I was in, at that time, very isolated the first six months because they didn't know how my immune system was going to react. I had to stay home. I couldn't go out. I couldn't do anything. I went and had my treatment and I pretty much stayed isolated um, for the first six months. After that, they got a little more comfortable. I should also point out, I was getting scans every six weeks uh, so that they can monitor it. I was getting labs every two weeks, et cetera. Um, I had, which was nice for me. I mean, I had a private nurse that monitored me every time I was there for the four hours. Um, and like I say, this went on for almost a little over two years. Um, I was ecstatic because I had no side effects at all. And that's something that they were amazed by. You know, initially you might have been a little tired for the first month as your body adjusted. But after that, I went in and I had it and I went home and stayed in isolation. But at the six month mark, they're like, okay, you can go back to your normal life. Just come in every other Friday and do your thing. Um, so that was really great. And like I say, I, I did find out what the drug that led, you know, the, what I was taking led to, which was Keytruda. So I'm always happy when, like I can say, when I hear somebody's on that. Um, I, for me, it was just night and day from traditional in the sense that I went on with my life. It was just nothing. Uh, or it appeared to me. The worst part of it was probably the labs, getting stuck for the labs and having a CT scan every six months, I mean, six weeks. That was hard. Uh, then I went from CT scans every six weeks to every three months, did that for a year to twice a year, and then finally to once a year. And as I mentioned earlier, the doctors were very cautious. They, every time I asked them a question, so what's next? Well, they're like, we don't know. Yeah. We're, we're waiting for you to tell us what's next because there's nobody ahead of you on this. So like Stephanie said, you have to trust your doctors, have a great relationship with them, and uh, assume that they're being as honest about your results but as far as, you know, they used to always say, why do you keep asking? I go, well, I want to know. You want to know, is this working? Is it not working? And they're like, we can't tell you. You know, we know what your results are, but we can't tell you if it's working. Uh, so we'll take it step by step. And that's why I say when they finally said, like, you've been dead for a while, but it took us this long to feel comfortable enough to tell you you're dead. That must have been a, a relief after all the frustration of not getting an answer. I definitely had tears in my eyes on that day. There was no doubt. Mm -hmm. 
John, was your experience similar? Did you have any side effects and, and how was the, the quality of the care you received? Yeah, I have to agree with both Stephanie and uh, Sunshine. Uh, it was effortless uh, compared to what I had been through, you know, with, with four different, uh, two chemo cycles, four different combo drugs. Uh, it did a job on me, but I still, I still would go for my treatments and go, go work right from the hospital. But immunotherapy, uh, effortless. I mean, a, a 30 minute infusion, uh, <clears throat> no side effects initially. Uh, uh, I would, uh, I, I had developed, uh, the thing is with immunotherapy drugs, it, it, you know, we're creating the data, you know, we're so new at it. In fact, uh, immunotherapy for prostate cancer is so new. I mean, it was considered an experiment with me back when, but I think now more and more, uh, treatment modalities are being done with combinations of conventional and immunotherapy, uh, not just immunotherapy on its own and seeing results. And I know that I'm creating a lot of data for my uh, treatment facility. Um, but in any case, my infusion, like I said, was 30 minutes. It was every three weeks initially. Over the six years, it went from three weeks to three months to six months to twice annually now. And they did indicate to me that I don't even need the two treatments a year, but it's kept me around this long and I've, I've not had any side effects, you know, other than some minor issues. And it's mostly not from the immunotherapy, but from the, uh, the, the drugs to keep that in check. Um, so one of them being prednisone, that's that's kind of causing me some issues over long-term use, but, um, I just have to, you know, to, to say that, you know, it's an option for you out there. It's it's not for everybody, like you said, but we're getting real close and it's being uh, offered for many forms of cancer and uh, prostate not being one back when is now. So um, talk to your doctors about it, about getting the test, the proper testing done, which like I said, usually involves both genetic and genomic sequencing to identify what's driving your cancer so they can tailor it to a, you know, a possible uh, immunotherapy option for you. Brian, can I jump in? Sure. So I just want to clarify one thing. Uh, unlike John and Sunshine, I actually did have a rough, I had rough side effects during treatment. So I had an injection into the site and I also had the Keytruda infusion and the Keytruda was not the problem, but the other two drugs were heavy drugs. They were uh, designed to juice my immune system. And so my immune system worked hard and I thought I really was out for the count two, two solid days after treatment and I was having treatment every week. So I can't say that there were no side effects or that they weren't impactful. I can say, certainly sit here today and say they were worth it, even though I wanted to quit a few times. I'm not going to lie. Um, but the uh, my doctors and my, my whole immunotherapy team assured me that the more robust your reaction, the better your yeah. outcomes might be that that that's mm -hmm. what they had been seeing when these guys went through it they didn't have a lot of data of what was coming but at least in my case i knew that the being sick it was a flu i had a couple of days of flu like symptoms after each treatment but that was uh, a good news a bad news good news story that 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 effect was a more robust response than other patients were having so I kept trying to hold on to that and, um, you know, let my doctors reprimand me every time I said, I don't want to do it anymore. <laughs> uh, that, that response, thank you for sharing that. And that's a very important point. That's, yeah. you know, the, the response of each patient will be different. Um, it's often unpredictable, although 
uh, scientists are getting better at, at knowing which patient might or might not have that, that kind of side effect, and uh, they can prepare and often treat those uh, side effects as well. Uh, in fact, uh, Stephanie, with the direct injection of the immunotherapy into your tumor, the flu-like symptoms are a very classic response. Uh, Dr. Yeah. William Coley, who, whose daughter founded our organization, did that kind of work in the late 19th century, injecting you know, bacteria directly into tumors and had about a 20, 25% response rate among his thousands of patients, um, many of whom had those flu-like symptoms. So it's very, very classic. Um, yeah. Like to ask, so, so each of you received what's called a checkpoint blockade uh, or immune checkpoint inhibitor. Uh, in your case, all the same drug, but of course there are many other uh, now types of checkpoint inhibitors available to patients used alone or in combination. Sunshine, did your doctors explain to you what a checkpoint inhibitor is and how it works? It sounds like you didn't care. It sounds like you were just like, just give me whatever. I don't exactly. Care. <laughs> exactly. At that stage, it, totally unknown. I, I, my, I put a lot of faith and trust into my doctors. Mm -hmm. And Stephanie, did, did, did they explain to you uh, at, at your treatment center what, what it was you were getting and how it works? This is care? the first time I've heard the phrase checkpoint inhibitor. So I just jotted it down. I've never heard that. Okay. And I imagine, John, you, you must know uh, or might have even known going into it. But, but is that, did you know about this? And, and did you have to explain? Do you have any questions as much as you know? I already knew, Brian. Um, when, this, when the subject came up about possibly using immunotherapy to treat my disease, I mean, it it really went no further than that, other than the name of the drug, and I approved. Let's go. Let's do it. Mm -hmm. That's great. Uh, I, I'm curious about uh, support networks and caregivers. We know that uh, having family around or friends to help patients uh, go through this is, is vital. Um, many say, you know, you can't do it alone. I'm curious about Stephanie. Was there anyone around you that was helping support you as you were going through this experience? I mean, I, again, it's so different for everyone and I'll be honest. Well, first of all, I have gone through this during COVID. So the uh, interaction and engagement with people was kept to a minimum because if I got sick from COVID during the trial, that would have interrupted treatment. So I was vigilant. Uh, I have fantastic daughters who stepped in when needed, but I really kept it to a very small circle. I was worried about my health and getting sick from something else. And um, my, the team at my hospital was amazing. They were available to me by text anytime, which, you know, it, it, 10 years ago, that wasn't even a thing. And now it was, that was key for me. Um, you know, I, I've a lot of cancer experience. So my tendency when I'm not well is to just kind of burrow in and hunker down and wait for the medicine to work. Uh, so I did not share it widely. I'm actually through these summits, the conference and uh, this, this, uh, webinar today. It's really the first time I've talked about it extensively. So mm -hmm. I had support, but it was very close and intimate. John, how about you? Who who was around you? Um, I come from a very large family. Anyways, I have I've had the love and support of my entire family throughout the process. Uh, Close friends have always been there for me. Um, I find it kind of unusual that some some other very close friends just abandoned me. But yeah, sure, um, that's their loss. The way I look at it, you know, I I heavily advocate for for prostate cancer. I'm I'm involved in several forums for it and meet meet uh, regularly on you know providing inspiration and support to them. Um, you know, I, I take nothing for granted anymore. I uh, I don't sweat the small stuff anymore. Uh, I just I'm thankful for every day I'm blessed with, and and I become more compassionate. I I tend to give back more than I receive now, and it's changed me as a person. Sunshine, how about you? Who who was around you? 
Um, my family was there uh, and close friends. Initially, the first six months, it was more, you know, via phone, text, that type of thing, because as I mentioned, they were, wanted me to stay a little isolated. I had a great relationship with my uh, PA, um, who yeah. followed me through the whole journey. I uh, was always there, and as the staff, I mean, I, I just couldn't believe this. The staff at the center was great. Um, but after the six months, then yes, people were taking me down, wanting to be a part of it, et cetera. I, I do want to echo what John said. One of the things that I think coming on, out on this side, um, you know, I, I have multiple tattoos on my body. One says bless, one says just breathe. It's to remind myself that every day is a blessing and giving back probably has totally gone to the extreme, if you want to say that, because I feel like my life was saved for a reason. Mm -hmm. And I want to make sure I honor that reason. And I think that's about giving back. And part of that is through this, giving people an opportunity to understand their options. There's life out there, regardless of what you're sent, they sentence you to initially, you can't accept it. You have to believe that there is a path forward. We're just about out of time, but I'd like to ask each of you, uh, what's one thing either a piece of advice you would like uh, those watching to, to, to know, or uh, what is one thing that you wish you knew then that you know now that you're on the other side of the experience? And we'll start with Stephanie. I hate giving advice, <laughs> but I will say, I 100% agree with John. The cancer journey for me has taught me not to sweat the small stuff. I learned that early on and that has been a weird gift. So now that I'm on the other side, I, it's too soon for me to say I'm on the other side, frankly. <laughs> I'm still kind of processing and trying to wrap my head around this kind of, again, little miracle. But, um, you know, I'm, I'm not going to give in on anything, really. I'm old enough that I know the path that I should be on, and I'm going to keep pushing. And even if pushing means pushing while sick, or pushing while low, or pushing while, you know, behind the eight ball, I'm still going to go. And uh, I think that's a weird gift that cancer has given me. John, how about you? I would have to say that uh, never, never give in to this. Um, advances in, in uh, medical treatments has come so far. I mean, just in the last, you know, eight years that I was diagnosed, there's so much more available now. And, and the thing is, like you had mentioned earlier, is, is, is to get from one step to the next and hope for, for something more advanced to come along. Um, mm -hmm current treatments are keeping us alive. Um, so to everybody is, is to, you know, follow your journey. Don't, don't give in to this, keep fighting. Uh, something will become you as well um, in, in the form of uh, miraculous medical advances. So I'm sure that that's, that's a, a, a message that, that lots of people need to hear. And Sunshine, any, any last remarks, any, any last thing you'd like to say? Just that, just that there's options out there, keep pursuing, keep believing. Um, I do think it's important to find a place that's connected with a research institute of some sort, because that will allow you opportunities that may not be openly available or knowledgeable of, but if you're associated with a research center, you learn that there's things that they can administer to you just because they're associated with that research mm -hmm. facility. And just live life. 
Live life is all I, best thing I can say. Yeah, a simple but clear and meaningful message. Well, that's all the time we have for our discussion today. Thank you. I want to thank our panelists, Stephanie, Sunshine, and John, for sharing your stories. Know that uh, by doing this, you are helping thousands of cancer patients who are watching this program uh, right now and in the year ahead on demand, uh, who are facing this journey, who are receiving those prognoses, those expiration dates, but I think each of you is here to prove that that is not necessarily how things have to wind up. Stay determined, stay hopeful, stay on top of your care, get to the next thing, because there's always something around the corner. And each one of you is proof of that. So I just want to thank you for sharing those experiences. I want to uh, thank all those who are, are watching this program, as well as our sponsors who have made this program possible. Uh, Again, all of this will be available on demand. So if you found this information valuable, please share this with those you know who are also going through this treatment. Once again, Stephanie, Sunshine, and John, thanks so much. And go on and live your lives. That's what this is all about.